to uh, turn now to God's word. I'm going to read a couple of passages uh, from Genesis. One in chapter 11 and the next one in chapter 12. And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. Came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar. And they dwelt there. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and slime they had for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower, which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language. And this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them, which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down. And there confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth. And they left off to build a city. Therefore the name of it is called Babel. Because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth. And from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. Just leaving off there to go on to chapter 12 now of Genesis, verse 1. Now the Lord has said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee, and I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, And curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him. And Lot went with him. And Abram was 75 years old when he departed out of Haran. And Abram took Sarai his wife and Lot his brother's son. And all their substance that they had gathered. And the souls that they had gotten in Haran. And they went forth to go into the land of Canaan, and into the land of Canaan they came. And Abram passed through the land unto the place of Shechem, unto the plain of Moreh. And the Canaanite was in the land. And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed I will give this land. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord who had appeared unto him. Well, may the Lord seal the blessing and the truth of God's word in our hearts tonight as we further ponder these passages. Well, tonight I'd like to bring a message. When God intervenes. When God intervenes. We read earlier those two passages from Genesis chapter 11, chapter 12. And I'd like to do something uh, which um, you might be able to understand. When we think about the word of God as being food, then we can perhaps think of uh, perhaps a slab of cake being cut up. You know, when you cut up a fruit cake, you know, you might cut through the glassy cherry. There's a piece left on that slice and a piece on that side. Or you might cut through some nuts or some other fruit or whatever it might be. Here, I want to cut up, as it were, the word of God, but I want to do it in a right way. Timothy um, was given advice from the Apostle Paul when he wrote to him, 2 Timothy 2.15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And that's what I want to do tonight. I'm going to take these two passages, I'm going to cut them up. And going to put certain parts together and make three sort of sections, if you like. 
And in them, I want to sort of bring out the similarities, as it were, of those two portions in chapters 11 and 12, and also the contrasts. And in doing so, I think you might see, first of all, the similarities. You see where God intervenes. This is really the, the sort of thrust of the message, like when God intervenes. And he intervened, didn't he not, uh, at the Tower of Babel and also uh, in the life and family of Abram. He intervened in a big way. Hallelujah. And it meant, of course, that the similarities there, you get movement and displacement, as it were. And you get separation as well that happened certainly at the end of that uh, passage that we're reading in chapter 11, where God scattered the people. And um, also separation we get in the family of Abram, where he's separated from his father's family. And also you get not only similarities in these uh, two passages, but also you get contrasts, differences in other words. Um, you get, first of all, in the first one, you get disobedience of mankind. And you get the obedience of Abraham heeding the call of God to separate and go to a country that the Lord would show him. In the first passage in chapter 11, you get man's self-reliance, shunning God, man doing his own thing and wanting to go his own way and do his own thing. Whereas with Abram, you see there in that passage that he was reliant upon God. He was one who sought to obey God's call. Hallelujah. So let me take then this passage, or these two passages, I should say, cutting them up, and I'm going to put the first section in just setting the scene. And I'm going to read the two um, parts together from Genesis 11 and Genesis 12. And the first verse, I think, in each sets the scene. Now the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. Chapter 12. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. This is really uh, showing you a sort of an introduction to what was going to happen in, in both of those cases. We can see what the conditions are like, as it were. And in the one, of course, uh, man was uh, banding together. Man was of one language and of one speech. And we know that when there is unity, then uh, there is a, a certain uh, a brashness that can uh, occur. Man, man might think he's strong. Man might think he's um, able to do without God. Because he's banding together and uh, he's forming a union, isn't he, here? Uh, an ungodly union, in this case, against God. And uh, we'll see this in, in the description of what we're about to read. Uh, whereas with Abraham, by contrast, we find that uh, Abraham here is being told to actually uh, separate himself from his kindred, his father's house, and to go to the land that the Lord will show him. This is really setting the scene then. Those two pieces, uh, those two verses indeed, in this case, put together just to set the scene. The second uh, section I want to bring is that of describing what the matter was there. And we'll go to Genesis chapter 11, verse 2 onwards, down to verse 7. Just, uh, just soak in, as it were, the description of um, what's going on here. It came to pass, verse 2, verse, uh, chapter 11, verse 2. As they journeyed from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick, and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone, and slime they had for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. Let us make us 
a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower, which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do. Now, nothing will be restrained from them, which they've imagined to do. Go to, let us go down and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. Just um, pause there as we just uh, ponder that description there. It's interesting there, in banding together, they'd actually come to a halt as they were journeying east in the plain of the land of Shina. And they're settling there. Um, you may remember, and again, I'm going to look it up so I don't misquote it, from right from the very outset of creation, man was given a command, and you find it in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 28. God bless them, that's God's Adam and Eve, and God has said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. God there is giving jurisdiction then to man to go out into the whole earth there and to subdue it, replenish the earth um, by uh, being fruitful and, being, and, and multiplying. In other words, having children as well. So there you have that command. Oh no, says man. And we're talking about after the flood now. Again, that was another intervention, wasn't it, of God, when God saw that the imagination of man's heart was evil continually. And he intervened and brought that flood in the day of Noah. And all mankind was obliterated, was annihilated, except one family, Noah's family, eight in all. But here we have afterwards man again rebelling against God, not going all over scattering, no, but actually coming together, banding together in the land of China. And what we find <clears throat> is that uh, as they bandied together, they want to... Did you notice that there? They build a city. <laughs> it's interesting. Um, the word in, the, in the, uh, the description that I read in the AV is go to. Did you notice that? Go to. Let us build us a city. And, and what else does it say? It says, go to. Let us make us brick and burn them thoroughly. It's interesting here because I've heard it said that the actual construction materials that were used um, had some sort of waterproof property. It says slime for mortar, and that would be some sort of form of pitch, uh, which would uh, be water-resistant, as it were. Um, and if indeed that was the case, that they were going against God, even in their, the choice of building material, then we can see that uh, that is indeed rebelling against what God has shown in the uh, Noah's flood, that he would not again obliterate mankind through a, a, a worldwide flood. But no, they were banding together, they're going against God, they're trying to do their own thing. Make the, in fact, it says there, build us a tower that may reach up to heaven and Make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad. They, they were <laughs> concerned to be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Again, contrary to what God had commanded. Um, it's quite interesting, making a name. Um, and we'll see that later on in the Genesis uh, 12 account as well. But making a name, I don't know whether you've ever been on a... Um, a uh, guided tour, perhaps, you know, around a, a city looking at uh, ancient buildings or whatever it might be. And if you're in a group of people, the, the group leader may well be holding up some sort of um, a stick with a, a name of, or a banner or something showing that, you know, where they are. So, in other words, uh, you don't lose them. You can you keep up the crowd, keep up with the group and follow the leader there. And here we are. Let us make us a name lest we be scattered abroad. I suspect you've heard the names Eddie Stobart, haven't you? In fact, you've seen it perhaps all over lorries and things. 
And, you know, I, I understand that Eddie Stobart was a, a godly and a Christian man. Um, but, yes, uh, name, of course, is not just to do with uh, letters, but it's to do with uh, respect, isn't it, to build um, some sort of reputation. And um, making a name. And the Lord was displeased, and we find that he, he came and he said, he also said, go to, in verse 7, Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord knew what to do. He, he uh, confounded their speech. They couldn't communicate with each other. Now, going on to Genesis 12, by contrast, we have God directing Abram, and he says, I will make of thee a great nation. I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. I will bless them that bless thee, Curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him. Lot went with him. Lot went with him there. Uh, that's his brother's son and all their substance that they had and, and all that they'd gathered and the souls that they'd gotten in Haran. And they went forth to go into the land of Canaan. And into the land of Canaan they came, and Abram passed through the land unto the place of Shechem, unto the plain of Moreh, and the Canaanite was in the land. It's interesting, that aspect of uh, making a name (laughs) comes up again in this chapter 12. With man, they wanted to make a name for themselves, didn't they? Let us make us a name, in verse 4 of chapter 11. In verse Um, 2 of chapter 12, we find here that the Lord is going to make a name for Abram. And I will make thy name great, he says, and thou shalt be a blessing. Isn't that wonderful? And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Are you in a family tonight? Are you part of the families of the earth? Well, under Abram, you're blessed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Wonderful. The name. I will make thy name great. It's interesting. We've got a Greek brother-in-law called Sophocles. And today is his name day. Celebrated a little bit like birthdays are. So everybody with that same name um, has made a fuss of, aren't they, basically? Uh, Sophocles. Uh, Wonderful. Name day. Yes, a good name, Proverbs says, a good name is rather to be chosen than great riches. And of course, in uh, Thessalonians, the Apostle Paul wrote to the church there and said, in verse 11, of uh, uh, chapter 1, Wherefore also we pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of his calling and fulfill the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power. Verse 12, that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and in him, and ye in him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. So, whilst it's good to have a good name, the name of our Lord Jesus Christ is to be um, uh, adulated and praised and worshipped that you may be glorified here in that name, which is above every name. Praise the Lord. So there we've seen something of, in the description of the matter here, we can see something of the similarities and contrasts uh, coming about between those two chapters. Just before I move on to the next section, I just want to highlight uh, that special um, blessing that God bestowed upon Abram. In verse 3 of chapter 12, God says, I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. We've made a comment on that. It's interesting that um, a few weeks ago when the Prime Minister of Israel was speaking at the UN, uh, he spoke about blessing and cursing about Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim. He made reference to that. So he was aware of this aspect of blessing and cursing. And you find here that um, what 
God has said he will perform, he will do it. He says, I will bless them that bless thee. And in effect, I will curse him. This notice the blessing is in plural and the curse is I will curse him, singular, that curseth thee. That's how it comes out in the AV. In other Bible translations, it comes out in the plurality. And I've not yet got to the bottom of why there is a difference, as it were. But nevertheless, uh, whether it's to do with the mercy of God, that he doesn't want to curse people, well, uh, may, may the Lord give understanding in these matters. But uh, there, is, there is this wonderful thing that we've seen right the way down through history, that those who have blessed the Jews have been blessed themselves, because, of course, Abraham has um, progressed on to the uh, Jewish nation, as it were. I will make of thee a great nation, uh, bless them, uh, I will bless thee and make thy name great. That's what we said, now shall be a blessing. So, if you want a blessing, look to the Lord to help you to bless uh, Israel. We've um, sought to um, petition the Lord regarding our foreign relations that we have as Great Britain toward Israel. And um, we've seen down through history that uh, when we have not blessed Israel, and uh, I think we saw this uh, just after the war when many Jews were seeking to uh, come to Israel from the death camps, that uh, we as a, a, a our British Navy turned them back. And it seems that since that time, uh, we have lost our empire, as it were. And we can see something of this being played out through history. I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. So I want to come on to the last section here, which is outcome of God's action. Going on from chapter 11 of Genesis, verse 8. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build a city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. In other words, the Lord accomplished what he'd first uh, said to uh, uh, Adam and Eve and, and the um, um, human family there, coming forward, um, that they should be scattered throughout the face of all the earth. Um, God will indeed uh, work his purposes out, and we're either in tune with that or we're out of kilter with it. Uh, whereas, of course, in uh, Genesis 12, we have the obedience here of um, Abram, Sorry, the appearance of God to Abram in verse 7. The Lord appeared unto Abram and said unto him, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. Now, even in that little phrase there is really the nub of the problems that we have in um, what's happening in Israel today. Unto thy seed will I give this land. And of course, it's the seed through... The, um, through um, Isaac, we know that the uh, line, as it were, passed from Abraham, or Abraham as he was then, to, through Isaac and Jacob and so forth. Um, and unto thy seed will I give this land. And that is what's being contested and what's, that's the nub of the problems. It's, uh, the world does not accept that. And we know that someday... We read in God's word that the whole nations, all the nations will be against uh, Israel and uh, be surrounding Jerusalem. And that's, of course, will precipitate the Lord's return in uh, chapter 19 of the Revelation. Now, I haven't got time really to go through uh, any other uh, aspects of um, the Lord. Uh, intervening in the affairs of man, but I could uh, go on to look at how Jesus intervened at that uh, sad time of that family, Martha and Mary with their brother who had died, Lazarus, 
And uh, in fact, you can read it for yourself in John 11, another 11, chapter 11, John's gospel this time. Um, But I just want to highlight, actually, in verse 23, there was an understanding um, by Martha, uh, because she said to Jesus when he arrived at at uh, at, at the house there, he said, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not have died. In other words, she, she believed that the presence of the Lord Jesus would be enough to actually um, perpetuate the life of her brother Lazarus. Um, but Jesus, of course, went on to say, thy brother shall rise again. And, of course, we know the, something of the conversation. We can read that there. But... Questions have been asked, haven't they? When we look back at the Holocaust and possibly what happened a fortnight ago in in Israel, um, where was God in all this? And this is really what Martha is saying. You know, if if you'd been here, my brother hadn't have died. But you know, uh, she didn't say it. But it's as much as you know. Well, where were you? But uh, we know that the Lord allows things to happen. Uh, We don't perhaps understand them at the time. But we do know that God is working his purposes out. And we know that in John 11, Jesus indeed called Lazarus from the grave and he came again. Hallelujah. Ah, And we find that Lazarus came back to life again. Yes. Ah. Oh. Well, may, may the Lord uh, help us to understand these various matters. We can see that Jesus' uh, outcome was that of blessing to that family and indeed to the wider family because what happened in verse 45, that many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen the things that Jesus did, i.e. the resurrection of Lazarus, uh, they believed on him. And so Jesus' name was glorified. Hallelujah. When God intervenes, there's quite a subject. I could go on much longer, but um, time is, is overtaking me here. But I do want to highlight in Matthew 24. Let me read these couple of verses, 21, 22. For then shall be great tribulation. Jesus is speaking about the last days, such as not was not since the beginning of the world to this time, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. In other words, God is going to intervene in the future to actually shorten those days of problems and trouble. Great tribulation, it says here in verse 21, we believe that to be Jacob's troubles. And uh, the reason why God is going to intervene is so that there might be some flesh actually su- survive those days. Except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Praise the Lord. The Lord is still in the business of intervening. And I want to close here by asking whether God has intervened in your life at all. Have you allowed him to? Or have you shut him out? If I can set the scene, again, going back to those three aspects of setting the scene, describing the matter, and then finally the outcome. The scene is set that all have sinned in Romans 3, 23. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I have sinned. You have sinned. Everybody you know has sinned. And everybody you don't know, they've sinned as well. All have sinned, come short of the glory of God. And let me describe the matter from Romans again, chapter 6 this time, 23. For the wages of sin is death. Going on to Acts and John quoting here. Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. There's a commandment in that, whereby we must be saved. I wonder, has God intervened in your life? Has he saved you from death? 
that's of course perpetual death. We're not talking about human death. We're talking about eternal damnation. You can be saved from it through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ who paid the price for your sins and for my sins. And John's gospel here, Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. There's only one way to God and that's through the Lord Jesus Christ. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So the outcome then, Psalm 9 Verse 17, the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. Uh, Luke 12, the Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looketh not for him and at an hour when he's not aware and will cut him and sunder and will appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. And uh, the Revelation chapter 20, verse 15. And whoso was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. What an outcome. I trust that's not your outcome for eternity, but that you're looking to the Lord Jesus. And if you are, then salvation is your portion. Hallelujah. Going back to Romans 6. For the wages of sin is death. We said that earlier. But the next bit of that um, verse is... But the gift of God is life eternal through Jesus Christ our Lord. Hallelujah. He that hath life, 1 John 5, hath the Son. Sorry, he that hath the Son hath life. And he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. It can't be plainer. You either have Jesus or you don't have him. Uh, These things I've written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life and that ye may believe on the name. We're back to the name, aren't we? Of the Son of God. May the Lord help us to understand God intervening and how precious that name is to have a good name, even the name of the Lord Jesus um, on our hearts. And may our names be written in the Lamb's Book of Life. May God help us. Amen.